Good morning, Pleasant View. I'm just so thrilled to be able to be here today and be able to speak once again God's words to all of you. I can't say it enough how much I love you and how much I know God has loved us and loved us together as his body here on this earth and get to serve with each other is such a privilege. Once again, I extend our welcome, though, to not only the faithful body of Pleasant View, but also mindful of all of our viewers that views in. Some has been with us for a long time and during time during this pandemic, and in particular, uh, also we gain some new viewers from time to time, and we sure appreciate them. I want to give thanks to God for our mission churches and many of those, their members that will view us uh, over time. And also, well, just giving thanks for those of the mission fields and our foreign missions as well, and particularly Mexico and for all those there. The Veronica and her situation and uh, the results of a miracle that God's performed and the salvation that's led from that point to several others. And uh, there's been many touched by the gospel, just knows that God's real. And that's all is a result that comes back to you, oh Pleasant View. Your faith and your movement, uh, but just as God was real in you, and you moved and touched the lives of others, and the gospel has been widely spread. And I'm so thankful for that. I really am. I commend and exhort by all of our church body. And first, I'd like to say I really want to commend you for your love for one another, your care and concern for each and every, each one. And I pray that we just try to expand what we're doing at every turn, that we can think and love those, maybe our young people, our youth, there are some that we don't naturally talk to, or from the reverse of that, some of our seniors and older ones. Uh, but we can share in this ministry together of, boy, just really talking, speaking, commending, putting us in memory of Christ that we've all confessed and we've all been baptized unto. But the communication is a crucial part during this pandemic time. And folks, I don't know, uh, we, I'm confident God will make us all be able to return someday, and I hope it's someday soon. I, this is, uh, honestly, I just uh, can't live without it, but at the same time, well, we're going to persevere and do what God has called us to do, and we're going to expand our boundaries. We're going to keep reaching and finding new ways to attract viewers and to do everything that we can to expand the gospel into the hearts and lives of many, many others. I can't tell you enough about Zoom, that uh, marvelous technology. And by the way, I've not only bought a computer, I'm in the process of learning how to at least get past turning it on and staying out of some of the other things and be able to, to really be able to make this productive and participate in all those things too. Uh, I do just say this to all those who have been like me, kind of hesitant in the technology and, and when moving that way and maybe even in the sense of a spirit of rebellion, not wanting to go that way. I just pray that you'll try to step up, step over, because a whole bunch of other people need you too. When they're on Zoom, you get to see each other and, and boy, that just is a blessing. We get to experience and hear from one another. Also, our children running through oftentimes uh, gets to be uh, appearing on there and it just reminds you of being back in church services so at least uh, it contributes in that manner uh, anyway I, can, I just can't say enough for all those to expand and literally I exhort that whatever we've done let's just do more and try to remember that word more from this Sunday on it is essential though, I think, and I really do, it sure is a big help, and even you have told me this, that you know, viewing together, or the idea that we're all kind of viewing together at uh, Rogers Sunday School time at 10 o'clock, and then the preaching hour at 11. And uh, but just being a part of those at the same time and keep in mind that everybody else is, it'll help you feel like we're all just assembled together. We have to do these things to make the best of this situation. Uh, we need to expand at every turn. For those that are calling and texting, I can't commend you enough, the group texting that I read from uh, just all throughout the whole week, uh, boy, just keep it up. Oh, there's some of you, you just win my heart every day as I see what you have spoken concerning God, God's word, uh, exhortations left and right. 
and I can't say but just one thing, you know, everywhere you can, just do a little more. Let's do a little more from week to week, uh, that expansion. Uh, also, boy, I can't uh, exhort us enough to be faithful in our tithes and offerings. And some of you have been kind of like me, maybe you've uh, uh, held back or miss a week or two and you keep it together and then you bring it in all at once. Well, all that hits that bank account. And if you're like me, I have a tendency to look down there and see that my bank account has a little more in it than what I was expecting because of my tithes and offerings hadn't been deducted. And as a result, I'll end up spending it. And then I get in trouble. And I don't want anybody else in trouble. And above all, we don't need to be in trouble with the Lord. And that's a dangerous old area to get in. Boy, that old robbing God stuff, even by accident. We don't want to do that, and you don't want to do that, I know, because I know you, Pleasant View, love the Lord. And as a result, well, let's be faithful. Let's get it in. Let's try to do it week to week. And the different means that we have from mailing it directly uh, through Zelle, the bank uh, uh, transfer group. And if you need any help with any of this, we also have an elder now that has uh, given himself to the full-time ministry with us and so thankful for Brother Montana. And he's not just an elder, he's now a financial elder. And boy, he'll serve well and he'll come and, and enable you. If you need somebody to pick up your tithes and offerings, he's a faithful servant of the Lord and will do so. Uh, and uh, I, I, my, me personally, I remind you, I won't touch uh, the money. I don't have nothing to do with the money. But uh, there are others that has that responsibility, God ordained and commissioned to do so. So, boy, just whatever it takes, let's keep it going. We don't want to rob God of his house of provisions. And uh, I just can't co encourage us enough to keep it up. Uh, if there's a need of a help with Zoom, uh, Brother Roger particularly sit down with me right here while we was uh, here on Sunday morning. Uh, and others, there's a few others that always brings their ties by. Brother Ron helps in the collection of that, and he sits there at the back. <coughs> and as he does so, uh, there are those that will come by and drop money in the plate there, distance six foot from Ron and all that. And then some stay and sit around, and they all got on Zoom that was in here, and Roger was showing them how. Uh, he helped me and Brother Clint here a couple of weeks ago, got us going. And now he's uh, working with anybody else. So if you have any interest and maybe not know how, don't be embarrassed. Just come on down and Roger will sure help you out. Uh, also, uh, if you have any concern about getting on Zoom, uh, just text Brother Roger and he insists on you doing so. Uh, text him uh, here right now. Uh, be very good. Anyway, I sure uh, want to get into our message today, and I love you all, and God will resemble our church, don't forget, and just be believing that and living for that. Uh, boy, my friends, I pray that we do develop a vaccine that really does work and is proven and tested by the science community and our medical community, and that we know that our people could be treated if they happen to get an infection. Uh, outside of that, I just don't want to be guilty of honestly enabling others to both cause an infection or uh, getting the infection either way. Uh, the point being, we just want to really love one another and do the loving thing through this time. And as a result, we'll just continue our prayers. And I know God who is faithful, he will reassemble our body coming soon. And in doing so, he's been preparing us as a church and speaking to us from week to week through his marvelous message. And today I wish to be able to speak to you about from a marvelous old text I love of St. John's Gospel, chapter 3, and then particularly verses 1, and we're going to read all the way through verse 18. But the honest truth behind this, in this text that I wish to share with you, it is all about the new birth experience, being born from above, or being born of the Spirit. It was the two translations that was always given. And as we do so, today I just want you to know that really though life comes from above. And I really want you to think about that. Life comes from above because I really believe 
that we have a dire need right now to be always remindful that we're not going to find life here in this world. We're not going to find it even with one another. Uh, you know, and we as a church miss one another. We miss the Christ that's present every time that we're present together. And all that's cr uh, just uh, crucial and important to faith. But during this moment, in this time, we need to realize that God is not found in these things. He's always above. And that life comes from above. It doesn't come from the elements of this world. It doesn't even come from one another. It really doesn't. You go to looking for it, all you're going to be is disappointed in the end when you look for your life from somebody else. No, look to God because that's where life comes from. He is life. And with that being said, let's go and read our marvelous old text that I love to read. And I'm going to do a little bit of an exegetical as we read these verses and go through them this way. And what we find out is that and I love the way the Holy Spirit moves old John to write this. But he said, there was a man. There was a man. And you know, really, everything just about begins with such a line. There was a man. Now, this man happened to be a Pharisee. That means he was a part of a religious group of a religious court, religious and, and a political court system back in that day known as the Sanhedrin. He was the right wing uh, group. The Sanhedrin represented the left-wing group. And uh, they practiced both their politics and their religion as one because Israel always believed it was the Old Testament church, a nation, political, and a, and a church. Now we notice that this man named, was named Nicodemus. And he was a ruler of the Jews, a man of pre prestige and importance. And this man of great prestige and importance he came to Jesus. Oh my, I just think of that. I, I, I just pause on those words, the breath of the Holy Spirit. This man, he just came to Jesus. You know, if you're going to go anywhere, the only place to go is Jesus. I can assure you that. You'll find wonderful things if you go to him. This man with uh, that's highly uh, religious, has a great education, and everything sought Jesus, came to Jesus by night, the scripture says. And then he said to him, Rabbi, or great teacher. And that's amazing. He marveled at Jesus' great teaching. Not only that, he says, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God. Now, that's amazing. He says, I really know that you've come from God. You've been with God. You know all about God. You know about things that the rest of us really don't know a thing about. And the reason I really know that you've come from God is for there's no one else that can do these signs, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, friends, I just want to remind you of these words. He says no one can do these signs. And just think what Jesus had been doing there for probably three and a half years or somewhere in there or during this time of three years. And Jesus had been healing the sick, multitudes of people. He touched uh, lepers, and you're never supposed to touch a leper, but he was noted to do so. And not only that, he couldn't be condemned for it even though it was against the law. But the reason is that every time he touched one, he was immediately healed. Oh, there was the blind that was born blind. And no man had ever been healed that was already born blind, but Jesus healed him coming and going. My goodness, there was a lame and couldn't walk. There was oh, the woman with the issue of blood. That's not even to get into all of us who have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and all those whose sins he freely forgiven while he was walking uh, on this whole earth during those years. And Nicodemus had taken all this in and seen the marvelous miracles to say nothing of the miracles that, like raising the dead, and he called old Lazarus from the grave, and Lazarus rose and, and was evident and was witnessed by so many. You see, the truth of it is, he knew that Jesus was from God. Now, that's about as far as he went at that time, but my goodness, that's a marvelous thing. And just think of this, he's gone to Jesus. Well, Jesus immediately replies and answers to him. 
He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you're born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what he said was, unless you're born again, and another term for that, and it used to say this in the old scripture of the King James Version, it would say, verily, verily, or most assuredly, but he says, verily, 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 three times, which anything repeated was for all eternity. He said, unless you're born again, unless you're born from above, from above, that's what if the term was, unless you're verily, verily, unless you was born from above, you could not even see the kingdom of God. So you see, life really does come from above. Life will never be found here. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again? or born when he is old? Or can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? Only thinking physically. But Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born of the water, of fleshly birth, a physical birth, and the spirit. So we need to be born and become a living soul and brought forth into this world and then have to have that soul born of the Spirit, made alive by the Spirit of God. He says he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, without uh, being born from above, you can't see the kingdom of God, and you sure can't enter it, even if you thought you saw it. You'd never enter it unless you're born of the Spirit of God. That which is born of flesh, man, it'll just always be old flesh, physical, dying, decaying, since Adam sinned. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. Spirit is unseen, but it's what's real. It's always living and always will be living, and it is eternal. Do not marvel, Jesus said, that I said to you, you must be born again. It's not a really a secret, but it is like the wind. You see, the spirit goes where it wishes, as the wind does. Now you can hear the sound and with the Spirit you can hear and see the effects of the Spirit in His presence when He touches your heart and life or the hearts and lives of others. So you can't, but you yourself can't control it. You can't control where the wind's coming from or where it goes. You don't even know those directions. Nor can you control the Holy Spirit. Nor can you assure yourself that you can control Him or have Him or anything else. So is that this so true? And then if anyone uh, who is born is born of the Spirit, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be, uh, uh, Jesus? And Jesus answered and said to him, How are you such a teacher of Israel, of the Bible, of the, all the prophets of the Old Testament, and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. Now the truth was, seeing Nicodemus, and even right here in this text, all he can think is the physical. He doesn't understand that God is spirit. And God far more cares about the spiritual things, such as your soul, than he does the physical things. The physical is just temporary. It's temporal in this life. But that which is spiritual is eternal, and it will last forever that which is spiritual is of and from God. But he says, most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. And so he's telling Nicodemus, man, I've told you and I've been testifying. And then those who I've called in this ministry, they're testifying too. And we're telling what we've seen. And you do not receive our witness. There's the problem with all of mankind. They haven't received the witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to the heaven, but he who has come down from heaven. Oh, my brethren, that is so important, and I hope to speak in detail on that right there, because the fact is no one can go to heaven, no one's been there, no one can cross that realm, but only the he who has come from there. And only through him can anyone else go there. And so it all becomes about this one, Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is the Son of Man. 
He says it is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. For God so loved, oh my goodness, so loved that he gave his only begotten son. I've had the privilege of preaching to this text I don't know how many times, and I get goosebumps every time I read that text again. I quote it, I believe, every day. But the honest truth is God really does love this world. My friend, if you're sitting there in your misery and, and the darkness of your own sins and you're thinking all the things that you probably have thoughts that God's thinking about you, I wish you could just think again. God really has loved you. God has loved this whole world and everybody in it. And boy, we're all rotten masses and some greater than others, but it, you're not, it doesn't change the fact. God loves this world. And he gave us a free gift, gave us his only, the only what he had, and everything that he had, and the gift of his own son. And with the gift of the only begotten son, that whoever will believe, whoever, man, I love that term. That means it can be anybody and it could be everybody. It's up to you right now, my friend, uh, that anybody, uh, whoever believes, now there's the word that will believe, and that word means really be living. Will be living in him. That means you gotta move out of you in this life, in this world, and really move living in the reality of that person, Jesus Christ, who has come to this earth to live for you. Believing in him. Yes, and that and in doing so you shall not perish. It's the only place that you could live in that ain't gonna perish. You know, this world is perishing. If you haven't looked in the mirror, do so quickly because it'll be a fading moment that'll pass so fast because you're passing too. Yes, everything here is perishing. Everything's slipping away and it'll soon do so. Even the elements of this earth and those things that's not found in God, has not returned to God or not born of God, they'll all be poured into the abyss of hell according to all scripture. That's perishing. And God knows about perishing. He doesn't want anybody to perish. My goodness, he gave all he had and the best he had and his own son to keep that from happening. And instead, what God wants you to have is everlasting life. Now, just think of what that word says. Everlasting life. He don't want it to ever end. My goodness, boy, you talk about somebody, you know, every time I really have fun or ever been to an exciting party, I never wanted it to end. God doesn't either. He doesn't want anything to end. You see, he gives everlasting life and it's absent of any perishing. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Oh, I wish our whole religious world could wake up and hear those words. I pray those who try, says they're messengers of light could hear those words. God did not come to or send his son to condemn anybody but quite the contrary, that through him they might be saved. My friend, God just wants you saved. God wants you delivered back to him. That's what that means, saved. To be able to be a part of him again. He who believes in him is not condemned. All it takes is just believing in him. And guess what? There's no condemnation for you ever again. You're not condemned. Have you done crimes? Absolutely. Did you do them all? Yes, you probably did. And you probably done a lot that you're not even aware of. But you know, God ain't here. Jesus didn't come to condemn you for any of your crimes, but in fact, to deliver you from all your crimes. Now, the he that does not believe, however, and won't believe or does not believe, he's condemned already. He lives in a condemned state. It's already going to hell. God ain't having to condemn anything to hell. He's trying to save it if we just get the message out there. Because he has not believed in the name, the one thing he's missing, he's not believed, he ain't living in the essence, the very makeup of the person, Jesus Christ, who is God's only begotten son. We'll hold right there. Boy, church, isn't it a marvelous thing that 
and the discoveries of this man Nicodemus. I thought it was just really kind of amazing myself, uh, all that he went through. But if we take notice, uh, it's a marvelous story, I think, uh, just in a story form. A man, that could have been you, it could be it could have been me, and in a real sense, it has been us that's believed in him, where we ended up coming to Jesus because we were so impressed with the things that we've heard of him that he uh, he done that there before us in our lives and through it the Holy Spirit brought us and brought us to him and in coming to him we get to discover his grand salvation and the results of that discovery is what the Bible calls being born again or born from above yes this is a quite a discovery as he came to Jesus and the scripture says by night I think it was just after he got off work and Jesus had kind of closed down for the day and was camped outside somewhere. And Nicodemus knew where that was at and he made his journey to find Jesus. Some believe he was fearful of the others and their condemnation of Christ that they would might condemn him too. I really don't believe that but as a result of what gets lived on uh, through because he reappears several times in Scripture and was the very man that also helped Ananias take Jesus from the cross and carry him to the tomb. Uh, you see, the truth is, he found out many things that was so needed. Uh, he found out what it was to be uh, born again, that the need is really true that everybody has. But that being born again or born from above, that's where life really is. To be born of the Spirit uh, you can't even see the kingdom of God, let alone have a hope of really getting there. Only from being born from above could anyone could, could enter the kingdom of God. You see, he discovered that in the, many of his ways of thinking of the past and his religious activity had left him really short of God up and down. And he found out that, boy, he needed to be born of the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit really pressed upon me, honestly, more of this theme, and that was just simply how much that, boy, we need to see in this time, and I think during this epidemic, honest truth, that we need to see how, boy, we need to, uh, uh, to, to really see how precious it is that life comes from above. Now, what I'm saying is simply this. We get all caught up in the present world we're living. Or we have emotions running to and fro, left and right, over this virus thing. Many of us are doing things like we don't like, like wearing masks and so forth, but it's for the protection not only of ourselves, but it's for others. We just need to realize that, guys, this whole place is death anyway. Everything about it is death. And all of us who are citizens here, if we're only citizens of here, we're living in death. And soon we'll slip away into eternity of eternal death, which is hell. The truth is we need to be born out of such a state. And that's what I hope that I can present. And church, I needed, I felt like we need to be reminded that guys, we don't find our life from here. We find our life from above. And every day we get out of that bed. And by the way, as Sister Cecilia reminded some the other day, she didn't know what, why she was feeling pretty miserable, she said. And I, what I heard was then she discovered that she forgot to do her walkabout for a few days. Now, I want to tell you, if you don't roll out of that bed and go out and do that walkabout, you know, where you walk on by the cross and you make sure that all your sins was placed there in Christ and put to death, you hurry on over to the tomb and make sure your Savior conquered hell, death, and grave and everything that's wrong with you and that he did such a perfect job of it that God had raised him the third day from hell, death, and all your old nasty sins and you'll never have to see them again. And then get outside that tomb and continue that walk about and live the rest of the day rejoicing in Jesus and what he's done. Church, I can't tell you enough that to keep on living born again. Be live born above. Keep your eyes up on, the, up on the cross and then look past the cross right into the glory of God in heaven itself. 
You see, my friends, not only did I hope to remind us that, that life comes from above, but also to remind us that life doesn't come from this world. It doesn't come from the politics of the world either. I don't. Some uh, must be very disappointed, but it doesn't. And it doesn't come from all the the the, the rigmaroles of the world, philosophies, and such the like. Life will only come from God. God is the giver of life, and it comes from no other but Him. And so I ask of us not to look for it in ourselves, in this world, in this life, but look above. Lift up your eyes and see the glory of God as the scripture tells us to. Yes, life comes from God and it only comes from above. The world, the flesh, uh, man, this old place, it's accursed. It's separated from God. God's not a part of it and he does remain above. And any man that looks to him through Jesus will be saved and you'll be delivered and instead of us really living here, we'll live there above, there in the kingdom of God. You see, God, Jesus wasn't kidding. It's a real possibility to live there even now through faith, as Nicodemus found out. The thing he needed was to be born of the Spirit of God, that he could see those things and live there in the things that's there with God. And think about that. That's mercy, that's love, that's grace, that's the forgiveness of all your sins. You see, everything that's good, it all comes from above. It comes from God. So lift up your eyes, old church, old Pleasant View, and you faithful, keep on the faithfulness. Expand it, though, to some of your brethren. We do have, and I do think it's just a very few from talk calls and talking, but a few that really wavering. One thing that really hurts people is when you miss this YouTube broadcast. Boy, guys, don't do that. Uh, the other thing that can get us is, again, boy, we fail in our tithes and offerings and being faithful and all that that, that most uh, wouldn't mean to do, no more than nothing. But uh, anyway, the, uh, the disadvantages and the how-tos and the how-comes, we're trying to overcome all those. Uh, also, but just like the tell us church uh, you know kind of concerning of the few and maybe tired and weary you know just kind of just get beat down you know this it's depressing to know a virus is there and that any moment you could come down with it or someone else and again if you talk to any of our members and we've had a couple three or four matter of fact uh, that has caught this thing I promise you they don't want anybody to have to experience it uh, they don't want anybody to, you know, to, to feel like that they may have caused someone else to experience it. And it does affect others differently. It might not affect you as, as harshly, but they're saying that almost everybody is affected negatively over a long period of time. Anyway, the point being, and I don't know, but guys, don't look at all that and all the negativities of it and what all can and couldn't. You know, we're being safe. We're going to preach the gospel and we're going to keep living from day to day that life comes from above. It doesn't come from here anyway. So, boy, let's live it and let's bring it because others here on this old earth, they need to know where life comes from. So, church, I preach this to help us to remind others to really reach for others and remind them to join with us here on the YouTube, to extend and expand. Uh, boy, get involved with that fellowship with Zoom. I can't tell you enough. Uh, that'll do, just be wonderful. And when we all return, whether it's a week or two or months from now, by golly, we'll return in victory. And we'll have our whole body back together, God willing, and all well and good. And we'll pursue those ministries that you can't believe and by the way there's been a lot of pr uh, precious work being done and a whole new version for our whole church and look forward to that that'll bless you to no end you see the truth is life does come from above and from above only all those who are of this old world they need to know that they need to know where they could look for life where they might find life and find real life the only place that is is from above you can find life too the definition of life is so important now, and I pray that you really understand what it means. What real life is, is intimacy with God. That's right. It's really a, a, a term that it is all meaning union with. It's being one with and one that's with you. That's a union with God. 
Now that through sin and death, that's only possible through Jesus, which I'll make clear here in a moment. The only way we can get back to God is through Jesus. The only way we can even see the kingdom of God is through the work that Christ did, as he said himself, as surely as Moses lifted the old serpent uh, there and the people looked on it and was spared from their poisonous disease, that's the only way you can be spared of yours by looking to Jesus and his marvelous work of salvation. The de definition of life is intimacy with God, intimacy of the soul. That means the mind and thought, to have God in your thoughts. Desires and feelings now back again with God. See, we used to have all this before Adam sinned, but we lost it all right after his old treachery and death and sin. We can have some empty knowledge and know some things and even learn things out of the Bible and even learn to quote the Bible in his scripture. But oh, my friend, until the Spirit of God's in there, the Spirit that's in that scriptures never speaks to you. So I just pray today you understand the significance and the importance and the understanding of what real life is, the intimacy of the soul. God in your feelings, his love, his mercy, his grace, all the experiences that you've ever had with him should be there in your feelings and oh, it should be so wonderful that it literally motivates all your senses to some form of love and service right back to him. You see, my friends, uh, uh, death is the breaking, is the breaking of that intimacy. It's literally an adulterous act because what happened through Adam and sin and death is Adam through his eating of that fruit of knowledge of himself and knowing of self, he took his thoughts from God and only placed them in himself, an ugly, ugly, rebellious act. And his desires no longer was for God, it was really just for himself. Everything he wanted to feel from then on was only for himself. And the only thing his senses responds to is himself. Yes, self becomes the old vibrant enemy of us all. It's what can keep us from Christ and God is nothing more than yourself. Boy, my friend, I pray your soul will hear these words and understand that you don't have life until you have God in your soul again. That's why it's a necessity to be what the Bible calls born again. You see, mankind is such a special creation, and I sure want to make this point. Guys, it's not like many have said uh, and speculated on in the days of past. There are those who have uh, said that uh, we were created because God was lonely. When I was growing up, that was a popular view. That God created because he was just sad and lonely out there. That really he's not holy, which means complete in himself, in need of nothing. And uh, But anyway, they'd say maybe even that he was those things, but the only thing they could come up with in man's thought and theory was that God was lonely or that he created man out of some sort of need, that we were created because God needed us. Well, that's flattery, I guess, but my friend, God really doesn't need us. He needs nothing. He is complete in himself. And boy, the Bible teaches that from Genesis to Revelation. Yes, no, God doesn't need us. Uh, God didn't create man out of need. God and his holiness and completeness needs nothing. And he really doesn't need you or me. But the truth is, we need him. And that's the only way we can have life again, is because we, it only comes from him. And some says that God created because he wanted us to praise him. Well, I think praising him is a pretty natural thing, but I don't think us praising him adds a thing to him or to his character or the grandeur of his character. And the Puritans, they too come along and said, well, Listen, God created everything for the glory of God. Now, in the fact, there's a lot of truth to that. Even our sin and fall will serve to the glory of God. And then especially our salvation. God having grace and mercy on us, my goodness. But you know what? God doesn't need us and we don't add a thing to his glory. That was already there. He was already complete in himself. And he's just, uh, he has no limits or needs us to glorify him. He doesn't add a thing. We can't add a thing to him. He is totally complete in himself. 
So whatever we've done, that's just what we do. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. I want to glorify God. I want to give Him the glory for everything He's done. I want to praise Him day and night. You understand? But it's because He's already complete and perfect in Himself. He sent me a perfect salvation that really saved me. And I can't help love Him just as I know He's loved me and loved you. Yes, friend, but God has created us all and the motive is what struck my heart right there. His motive for creating us, and don't get me wrong, he really did have a motive. He just wanted to love you. Now, ain't that something? You see, God is, is defined. John does it himself. And God is spirit, unseen but so real. But he's more than just that. He is love. God is love. My friend, you see... God just full of love. And all God wanted to do is love you. Isn't that amazing? All he's ever wanted to do is love you. And boy, did he ever love us. And for a little short time, there was intimacy there where God and his love just filled our minds. And for a short time, now this is all before sin with Adam and Eve, but in a short time, God just filled their desires, their mind, and all of their feelings and all their senses responded to a love affair with God. And in turn, God just really loved them and they loved God. Oh, it's an intimacy that we share with God, my friend. That is life. And you feel the absence of your soul, you try to fill it with the things of this world. You fill your old thoughts up with the, the affairs of this world, the troubles of your own heart instead of filling it up with the Lord. You know, see, you'll always feel dead. You'll always feel incomplete. See, those things never satisfy. Chase your pleasures and all your desires. Chase them hard and well, but all you'll still find is in your soul you're still empty if God's not there. You see, my friend, you need the presence and reality of God in every part of your being, your inner being. And it's always described in those parts of your thoughts and your desires and in all that you feel God should be in there you should be feeling him and not the things of the world it's so funny how sensitive I am anymore to the anger and I'm amazed that my flesh can rise up I don't have to go any further than just uh, in the same room that I'm in in there with me because my anger and my old flesh can rise up within me and then my heart just is saddened because all I was thinking of was me and when I'm thinking of God I realize man that's just pain that'll bring me pain and I don't want that but I want to live intimate with God yes intimacy my friends that's the definition of life intimacy with God yes and that led by the way the misunderstanding of this leads to some grievous errors people lost people having to live being taught by religious people that God is watching them that he spends all time just watching them and he's keeping score and for any wrong thing they do see they're all on the self eating of the tree of good and knowledge, good and evil and they're on the knowledge thing that God's up there collecting knowledge of what you do that he can't wait to punish you for all the bad things that you've done that he's uh, God just uh, mad at you and if you think about it if he's going to be mad at you for a sin that means he's mad at you all day long because there ain't nothing of you measures up to God. See, sin is missing God. You've never measured up to God about anything. You see, the truth of it is, that's not true at all. What God was doing is loving you. He ain't mad at you. He just wants you to come to his son that you can be saved and have God in your heart again. You see, God can't, there are those that teach us that God can't wait for you to pass this little day of grace and life that he has abundantly given, by the way, but the honest truth, they, can, they say and they teach this, that God can't wait for you to perish in hell and that he just waits to turn on the burners, so to speak. Things of that sort, all that is very incorrect uh, things. They're twisted imaginations that runs to and fro. They're books of works and righteousness that has nothing to do with Christ at all. You see, the truth of it is God just loved you. He loved you so much, he knew you couldn't do nothing about your situation. That's why he gave the gift of his only son. 
It was God himself that could do everything it takes to save us. And that's exactly what he did. You see, life in God, alive in God, God in us. Oh, oneness, a beauty, uh, nothing but good. Uh, by the way, in the original state, where I remind you, God said that original state where they was just one all together, Adam and Eve and God, he said that was a very good, my goodness, very good, and expressed by God. You see, God just really wants to love you. He wants you and him to be having a very good relationship every day. And not only today, but everlasting life uh, all the way through eternity. The truth is, though, oh, Adam, after that love affair, he ate of the tree of knowledge of the sin of death. He ate into the power of a fruit that could kill him. The knowledge of good and evil. Many lives by that same fruit every day and thinking they're doing God a favor. Only God can handle good and evil. That's his alone. He knows what it is. And his good and evil, it doesn't even compare to what mankind has always made it to be. You see, the truth is, leave that stuff alone. You just want to go and be a partaker of the person, Jesus Christ, who came after Adam's debacle and lived a life for us. Adam ate, sinned, and death passed upon us all. The scripture says, and think of that word pass for a second. It means it roared through the ages. You see, everything is really right there before God. And it's very clear scripturally that the first day and the last day is all the same to God. You see, it's just right there. But way back there somewhere in God and Adam's love affair, then God telling Adam not to eat of that tree of fruit. When Adam did... That sin and death just passed through the generations all the way to the very end. And what that should tell us is anybody going to get to heaven that lived back there, they'd have to get there through hearing about Jesus because that life came from above. In our generation right now, if anybody's going to get to be a part of heaven and experience God's great love, because all he wants to do is just love you, you have to be born again right now in this lifetime, right here and now. You see, the truth is, and it's so important to uphold and to take hold of and not be like the empty-minded and the fools that runs to and fro. My friends, we uh, don't have the ability to save ourselves. We're in a dead state, separated from love. Love, real love, God's love, is not even a part of us. It never was, ever since Adam. You see, that old death is passed and we're separated from God. We're born separated. And all that is is that we live out a life that misses God all over the place. It's what he calls born dead in trespasses and sin and left in a state of inability. We're left in a state of total darkness to spiritual things, blind and deaf to anything that God could say where his breath could come to us to reunite with us. Yes, we are left in a uh, spiritually disconcerned. We couldn't discern something if God was standing right there. We wouldn't know it. We left in a helpless, hopeless, uh, condemned already state. Oh, my friend, I just pray everybody gets to know what Jesus did. You see the truth in that condemned state, we walk around strutting, saying what's in, uh, that, boy, I'm in control of life and I'm choosing this and I decide that. But all it is is a life that's filled with the, what's called the works of the flesh. It is envies and greeds, all oh, those old proud looks, adulteries left and right of all kinds, and idolatry always live, where we're living for and worshiping anything else rather than God. Oh, in it is anger and hate, wrath and vengeance that we try to take when the only one that has the right for any of those things is only God. You see, the truth is, church, it was just like the Old Testament church of Israel. That's what we pretty well have lived. The truth is, uh, in that state, uh, in the comparison of such a state, that God, out of love for Israel, he came to them through Moses, as God has come to us through Jesus. But in the day of Moses, it's a fact. You see, God delivered those people. He spoke the word through Moses, and Moses led them out. They had to go through what was called a wilderness. It was only really a one-day journey, from what I understand, to the banks of a promised land that God promised to give them. Now, that's just the physical side. That means so much more spiritually. 
But those people walked out and they finally got across that Red Sea and got to the other side, but all they commenced to doing was murmuring and complaining and living a life that the Bible calls unbelief. They didn't keep God in their thoughts. They didn't keep Him in their hearts. They didn't keep Him in their feelings. They murmured and grumbled and griped at every turn, though God took perfect care of them, feeding them. Manna from heaven didn't even have to cook or work or do any of those things. Uh, boy, Moses provided water and uh, all the different things that took place. A uh, pillar of fire at night to keep away the chill. And then, boy, air conditioning in the day put a cloud that cooled them all. By the way, remember there was about four million people on that little journey. That's a lot of people. Anyway, it's amazing to me how as they did so, finally the grumbling all come before God. The unbelief was at hand. They couldn't even do what God said, enter in. They turned back in their unbelief. And then God came and God took a serpent and has sent these serpents all upon them. And all that is is back to Adam and from the old garden. Those old serpents come in and bit them with that deadly poison. They were filled with that poison. They were dying here and there, left and right. And then God told Moses to take one of those serpents and to impale it upon his staff, which would kill it, but impale it on his staff and lift that staff high in the air and walk through the midst of all the congregation. And if anybody would, just look above, look above where life comes from, and you see that that snake's been killed and put to death for you. And I'll be doggone, that comparison lives so true with all of us today. In captivity, sin, death, whipped by the old devil every day, uh, my goodness, uh, uh, the beast that uh, controls our rage and so much inside of us when we're aware of old self. And God sent, as God sent Moses for them in that day, God sent Jesus for us this day. Oh, yes. And as God took care of them, God in our physical lives literally really takes care of us. Yeah, it's that unbelief, that unlived reality, uh, not living, God loving them. That's what causes all this unbelief, killing, death, and dead. Can't experience God, can't just really come to Him, can't call upon Him. Uh, you know, that judgment of those old snakes that came upon them, God sent Jesus here, and as Jesus was, says here in the text that He must be lifted up to die for all of our sins bearing our sins and the poisons of each and every one in himself that who lifted his he was lifted up on that old cross lifted up before god a righteous one without sin made sin for us imputed our sins poured in him our poisonous sins and then for that he died for all of our sins with our sins now, if you just think about it, you need a payment for sin, look up. You need a right life that was lived in your place because yours isn't right, look up. That was the only right life there ever was who bared our sins to that old cross and died in our place. Looking up is where salvation is. Putting him, putting even himself to death as God smited him and gave him the death blow and to take away the poisons of all of our sin where he did so and in three marvelous days had poured out that poison all over hell got rid of all of our sin and did it so perfectly that god and holiness raised him the third day that we too can be saved oh yes that's the most marvelous thing to just believe that old story just as jesus was lifted up as moses lifted up the servant the old serpent, that poisonous one, Jesus became the poison for us and died for us and it took all of our poison away. My goodness. And then thereby that if a man would just believe that, he shall be saved. Tell me God don't love you. Tell me he hasn't loved you. Tell me. Because boy, the truth is, that's all he's ever done was love you. His only desire is to love you. Adam sins, God comes after him. We've sinned and he's come after us. He's speaking to many of our viewers right now, I do believe. 
Now notice the one thing that's so essential and important is not just believing in Jesus because if you believe in him, you're not condemned. And you can never live condemned. Instead, you're delivered. You're saved by him. You see, if you're believing, then think of what that means. You're living in him. Living in his right life. Living in his payment for our sin. Living in his victory over our sins and the putting away of our sin. Living, raised, now no longer to die, but we're going to go to heaven because we're living in him. Any that believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But those uh, that will perish, it is only for one reason, because they have not believed. That's what he says. In the name, the essence, that characteristics, the attribute of Jesus himself, being the Son of God, and all of his power, might, and knowledge, and, and in fact, not living, not living, see, unbelief, not living in the works he done. His life for your life, his death for you, his burial for you, the putting away of all that nasty and poisonous you, and then the rising that you can rise in him and live with God again. Oh, my friend, all that is look above, look ahead. Jesus didn't remain here on this old world. Instead, he's gone to the right hand of Father that's above. He's making intercession for you right now. That's above. Now, he did come again in the Spirit to live in your heart that you can love him, that you can experience him, and that you can carry out that love affair not only with him now, but through him with God himself. God's just happy as peaches. He can love you again. And you ought to be happy as peaches because you can love him again. I love you today, and I know God has loved you. He's done everything that, he, that needs to be done to save you. And if that ain't love, I don't know what it would be. Boy, he's done everything to save you from your sin, the death that's facing you. My friend, get out of that life. Be born again. And boy, just call on the name of the Lord. Look to him. Boy, just look to the Lord. He's above. He's above all this that's here. He's the one that saves and to be born of him, to have him in your heart. He says he stands at the heart door and knocks and any man open up, he'll not only come in, but he'll abide, live there right on forever and he will sit down and sup with you. That means fellowship and eat and drink with you. You guys will be just one and just live with him. Oh, it's so fun living with him. I pray you have him today. I pray you'll be born from above. Just lift up your eyes and look above. And oh, my friend, don't be deceived by what's going on here. This will all pass, I promise you, but he will never pass, and you could be in him today. I pray for our viewer today, that you too, if you haven't come to him, if you haven't experienced, if you can't live him loving you, you know, and just really be able to believe that, I pray you hear this message, ponder upon those words. Go back and read, that's John chapter 3 and verse 1, and read it all the way at least through 18. And I, oh, my friend, I just pray, and I'm going to be praying for you right now as we're going to bow in this prayer. And so let us go to the Lord right now. Father, I just come, and Lord, I pray that you strengthen your body. And Lord, if there's any weak knees, that they'll be straight today. And Lord, after hearing this message, they'll know that you're the God that boy, has loved them and that they are born again and can have the confidence now to get about serving you through the means that we really have right now. And Lord, we can still reach and touch one another. We can evangelize and bring other viewers to watch boy, these messages that's just about you. Lord, I just pray that you speak to every heart and if a heavy heart's there, Lord, you'll unload that burden and they lift up their eyes that they can see you. Father, I just pray this, and I pray for all that is so heavy, burdened, and laden, and their eyes have never been able to look up. You know, it is sad, Lord, that so many runs to and fro, looking everywhere for relief or for some sort of life when they need to just simply look up. Father, help us as a church to tell others and to be that light that's here in this old dark world that we can show them where the real light is. It's in Jesus, and we too need to tell them, just look up, look up. 
Father, I just pray this message will be blessed to every heart and hear in the name of Jesus, for there is no other. Amen.